one of the major turning points in the Buddha's quest for awakening came at the end of his period of austerities. For six years he had been almost starving himself, trying to suppress his breath, trying to get away from all kinds of pleasure, to the point where he would fall over in a faint every time he went to the bathroom. And finally he realized it was getting him nowhere. This was not getting him in the state of true happiness that he was looking for. He reflected. He didn't see anybody else who had practiced as many austerities and been so extreme in austerities as he had been. And he saw that it led nowhere, so it was time to try something else. That's when he remembered the time he'd been practicing jhana. We're not really practicing in his mind. He'd spontaneously gotten into jhana when he was a child. He wondered, might that be the path? Something inside him said yes. He asked himself, why am I afraid that, of that pleasure? When he realized there was nothing to be afraid of, it didn't harm anyone, didn't harm himself, didn't befuddle his mind the way a lot of pleasures do. He decided to start eating again so he could have the bodily strength in order to get the mind back into that state of concentration. And then as a result he applied that concentration to learning about his own past lifetimes, the way beings die and are reborn. But most importantly, how to put an end to suffering in the mind. That was when he gained his awakening. And in gaining his awakening there was no comment about, I did something better than anyone else. Notice the difference there with the austerities. He was comparing himself with other people. But the knowledge of his awakening was simply facts. This is the way things are. Instead of thinking about other people at that point, he was thinking about what is it in the mind that leads to suffering. He was taking things apart in very impersonal terms. And in taking this matter-of-fact approach, he reached the fact of the matter. And so when he spoke, it wasn't out of any pride. When he taught, it wasn't out of pride. It was simply he was speaking directly from the truth. Issues of pride or no pride at that point didn't apply. It's good to keep this in mind as we're practicing, because sometimes pride can get in the way. We need a certain amount of self-confidence to do the practice, especially in the beginning when it seems like that as soon as we focus on the mind, all we see are huge messes in the mind. Thoughts that come springing up, some of which are pretty random, some of which we follow after and then we get, get down on ourselves for following after them. We begin to wonder, do we have it at all within us to do this? And you have to remember, this is something human beings can do. The path is for human beings and doesn't require anything superhuman. But it does mean taking very seriously, not so much what other people are doing, but simply what you're doing, and learning how to focus on that in a very matter-of-fact way. Developing a viewpoint that admits what's skillful and what's not skillful, and then develops the desire, okay, whatever, whatever's skillful, no matter how much I like it or don't like it, I'm going to get to develop it. If it's not skillful, I'm going to abandon it. In other words, you're trying to take yourself out of the picture as much as possible. You encourage your sense of self only when you find that you need it in order to encourage, keep yourself encouraged on the path, to keep yourself going, to remind yourself of why you want to follow this? Because you really do want a happiness you can trust. You're sick and tired of the happiness or the pleasures you've been running after up to now. They don't give any real satisfaction. You want something better. So remind yourself of that anytime you feel tempted to leave the path. Don't you want something better? The Buddha is actually saying, do you really love yourself? If you love yourself, you stick with the path. That's for times when you get discouraged in your ability to do this, and that's when it encourages you to reflect on the fact that other people can do this. They're human beings. I'm a human being. I can do it too. 
that kind of sense of self is useful. But it's like having an animal in the house. You've got to make sure the animal doesn't go back to its old animal ways, because a lot of the animal is to, likes to do is compare itself with other people. There's something about defining yourself in terms of the group you find yourself in. There was a nice little story I was reading just, just this evening about a little kid who in class at that day in school had made a little clay rabbit. He wasn't usually the first in his class, but that day the teacher said that his clay rabbit was the nicest of everybody else's. So he was very proud of that fact. He comes home, wants to show his amazing rabbit to his mother. She's been very busy in the kitchen. And there's a scene between the two of them as she's telling him, just, you know, put down that thing and go wash your hands and have, have your evening snack. And he gets upset because nobody's appreciating his wonderful clay rabbit. And the father comes home and he has to adjudicate between the two of them. And find them when everything's all settled. Then he tells the little kid, okay, take that piece of junk out and throw it away. And let's get down and have our meal. In other words, what may be an amazing clay rabbit in one context is just a piece of junk in another context. And so if the value of things depends on the context, what value do they have? If your sense of who you are depends on the context, you choose the people with whom you compare yourself and try to find people who, that you can say are not as good as you are. You're constantly having to define the context. Because you could also find other people in the world who are doing a lot better than you are in lots of different things. What's there to judge? Why do we have to compare? When we focus on the problem of suffering, there's no comparing with anybody else. Your suffering is your suffering. You can't even see anybody else's suffering. You can see the outside effects of their suffering. But the actual suffering itself is nothing you can see. So where are you going to compare? The facts of the matter are right here. You look inside your own mind, you look inside your own body. Your experience of the body as you sense it from within, as you're sitting here breathing right now. Where is the suffering? There may be pains in the body, but the real issue is the suffering in the mind. Can you separate those two? It's not a question of your suffering versus anyone else's suffering. It's just the suffering that's there. Even before you had a sense of yourself, there was suffering. The sense of yourself is the way you negotiate the world. But whether you're negotiating it well, whether other people around you are better than you are, are worse than you are, are equal to you, that's not the issue when you're face to face with your own suffering. And at this point, it's very impersonal. It's just the suffering that's there. Your sense of who you are around that suffering may, may be there, but that's something, as the Buddha said, you've got to learn how to put aside. This is what the not-self teaching is all about. Because one of the ways in which we make ourselves suffer a lot is we see ourselves as the victim of the suffering. It's like we're putting ourselves right in the line of fire. The people out there shooting bullets and just go and run in, in the way. Say there's a pain in your knee or there's a pain in your stomach. If it's your knee or your stomach, the pain gets transferred into the mind. If you don't make that connection, if you just allow it to be there, and you're here, it's one thing, you're something else. Then you're not in the line of fire. And then you can start watching your own mind. What is the mind doing that's creating mental suffering around the physical? How does it perceive things? What, is the, what are the labels that it puts on those things? And then you take that same lesson and you apply it to the mind. When mental suffering comes up totally unrelated to the body, how does that happen? Learn to take it, make it something impersonal, just the way things are. The way this movement of the mind affects that experience, and that experience affects this movement of the mind, how your perceptions and intentions and attentions, or acts of attention, influence one another. The more you can depersonalize this, the better. And 
It's because the Buddha saw the truth on this level that when he came out to teach, he roared as lions roar. It wasn't out of pride. It was simply, this is the way things are. And John Mahabhava has a nice comment on this. He says that once you're done with your issues, there's no question about, about being afraid or being brave. It's just you're just speaking the truth as it is, because you've seen the truth. You've been willing to look at the truth as it is. And that requires getting your sense of self out of the way. So if you find your sense of self raising its ugly head, I mean the ugly head being the one that's comparing itself to other people. Remember, everything when you measure that way depends on context. And if you feel the need to rate yourself higher than other people, what's the problem with your relationship with people who are higher than you in some areas? This is one of the reasons why the teaching on empathetic joy is really useful. Learning to be happy for other people, for their happiness. Our society is one that doesn't encourage that much. It teaches us if we see people, other, other people who look happy or they seem to be wealthier than we are, smarter than we are, we're supposed to be jealous of them. That seems to be what the main message is. Because you just be happier for them for what they've got. But realizing what they've got is what they've got, and you've got to turn around and look at what you've got. The Buddha has you reflect on the fact that you see someone who's really wealthy or really powerful, whatever. You've been there before. So it's nothing foreign. You see someone who's really poor and miserable. You've been there before, too. Use these contemplations to equalize things. And then the whole sense of having to compare yourself to other people gets weakened. So if you find yourself in indulging in unskillful pride, and this can be around things of the world or things of the drama, this, the way that we often see this is when people have been practicing jhana and they want to compare their jhana to somebody else's. As the Buddha said, when you do that, the basis for the comparison has been destroyed. Whatever jhana you had is not there when you're doing the comparison. And that gets in the way. You become a person, as he says, a person of no integrity. It, it, it's a strong statement. It means it to be strong, too. So if you find yourself making comparisons like that, ask yourself, well, what's the problem? Being with the fact, okay, there are other people who are better than you in some areas, and you're better than other people in other areas. And just leave it at that without having to build up a large sense of self, or either a proud self or a wounded self around that. We're here not for those kinds of comparisons. We're here to get down to the facts. Is there still suffering and stress in the mind, even in our sense of pride gets in the way there, too. Sometimes we won't admit to ourselves where the stress is, which is why we don't understand it. So where there is stress in your mind, admit the fact, and then look into it. See if we can understand what you're doing to cause it. And that's the way you get beyond. It's only when you look at things in a very matter-of-fact way. that you find the fact of the deathless, which at, at that point there's no more comparison. There's no need. The experience is sufficient in and of itself. So if there's a comparison, it means it's a sign of deficiency. Even when you feel that you're coming off better in terms of the comparison, the fact that your mind needs to do this, there's a deficiency someplace, so look into that. That's when you get to the truth that really matters. <laughs>